Hello, and we just finished watching the 95th Academy Awards. Uh, Connor and I uh, had a blast with some of his family. We did some predictions uh, on a little little sheet here. I, I came out as the winner. I got, I think I got 20, 20 right out of 23 categories. Connor got 16. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is a tradition we've done now. I think this is the fourth year in a row we've, we've kind of done this. So it's a lot of fun. It was a good show overall. Uh, Jimmy Kimmel did a great job. So we're excited to talk about it here today. I'm Austin Johnson. I'm Connor Izagiri. And this is Filmgasm. All right, man. Uh, I think it's safe to say this is one of the best Oscars in the past, you know, past decade or so. It's my favorite. Just the movies that were up, the stuff that won, the emotional resonance of pretty much every category. This was special. This was, I'd never, it's been such a shit show the last couple of years. It's been, there was COVID that made that one awkward. Then there was, you know, fucking Will Smith. So it was nice to have a scandal-free night with very little political element and just enjoy the, the movies. Yeah, that was that was the most refreshing part. I think you, you you pointed out, you know, COVID, and of course last year there was the the whole incident with uh, Will Smith and Chris Rock, and I'd just rather not talk about that. You know, uh, it's more fun to talk about a good Oscars where a lot of really quality stuff won. Uh, I was brought to tears multiple times. Uh, so I think the best Oscars that I've in my opinion, the past few years is the 2019 when Parasite just kind of swept the nation, you know, and, and did all this cool stuff. And Bong Joon-ho was freaking out. That was a great Oscars. The following year was that real weird one where they were, they were all separated and Nomadland uh, took took Best Picture. And there was the really weird, uh, like, Anthony Hopkins thing where he won at the end, but Chadwick Boseman, like, passed away, and it was really, really odd. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, last year. So it was good to be back, you know, with, with, with the proper Oscars. Everybody was, you know... Uh, in, in the normal theater, it felt right. Everybody's kind of close, intimate experience. So yeah, it was. It, it feels like they're back, you know. And with Jimmy Kimmel hosting, it just felt like it was in control right from the get go. He did his monologue. It wasn't too long. It wasn't. It didn't ever get out of hand. There's just some, you know, some good jabs, good jokes here and there. But most, for the most part, he just got through it smoothly. And then we didn't see him for like an hour and a half hmm. because everything just kept going. Boom, boom, boom. They bring out two people to do two awards. Bang, bang. Knock them out right away. And move move on. I love that. Uh, they also brought the uh, all the nominees from Best Song. They brought that back this year to perform all five songs. You know, I can take or leave that, but they, it was pretty good. You know, with the likes of you know Rihanna and Lady Gaga, like you kind of have to utilize those people to bring more viewers in. So overall, it was about three and a half hours. The show, which is what you want out of the Oscars, you don't want to go past four hours, and it did that. And it was so neat at the end. When everything ever once just started winning everything, and it was like, oh my god, here we go. Uh, and you have that brief, you know, um, bridge there where Brendan Fraser, the mm. the lone wolf from the whale, you know, uh, not not a lot of nominations for the whale, but we knew Brendan Fraser was, you know, uh, kind of the top dog in that category, and and he won, and it was really special. So I thought there were like a lot of great highlights from this show, and not much bullshit. Uh, there was only a couple times where I was kind of rolling my eyes and that that's great for any award ceremony. Yeah. If I was going to rate this one on the film gasm scale, I would give this a nine out of 10. Nice. I, I was, I was enamored the whole time. I loved it. The, the worst part for me was just, you know, Jimmy Kimmel doing dumb questions to the, like to the audience for people who were unprepared and didn't give a shit. And the weird Elizabeth Banks cocaine bear thing. Yeah. But even that was like, you know, not even nearly, as bad as we've, as shit we've gotten in the past. Like I will, for me, the worst thing ever at the Oscars, apart from, you know, the assault was one year where Ellen DeGeneres ordered pizza for everybody. Yeah. And that went on for like 20 minutes. <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah. That was so stupid. There was I, none of that this year. <laughs> no, all that kind of gimmicky stuff. I, I just, I just don't need it, you know? So there was a brief stint. Where we both were kind of like, okay, like Jimmy Kimmel, like we get it. And the, the bear was like crawling behind him. <laughs> it was pretty silly. Uh, I don't really know who the audience is for, for that particular part of the show. But if that's all we have to complain about, it is, you know, overall a good show. I'm very curious to hear what other people think about it. Because we literally 
finished the ceremony and we're recording now. Um, so this is a very fresh, you know, fresh take, fresh perspective from both of us. And we both had a good time. I'm very curious to hear what other people think, you know, other movie minds, other podcasts out there, what they think about the ceremony as, as, as a whole. But um, we are going to go through all 23 categories, you know, some of them briefly, some of them we'll take a little more time on. Um, but before we do that, I also think one part that was really special that definitely brought me to tears multiple times was the In Memoriam, mm-hmm. where Lindy Kravitz, uh, he, he sang, and it was really it was really neat. You just forget how many legends we lost over the past, you know, calendar year. Uh, I was, you know, just like, holy shit, just legend after legend after legend. So much so that they couldn't give as much time to each one because there's so damn many of them. So that was, that was like really well done. Uh, Lenny Kravitz, you know, great, great voice still has it. So that was awesome. Yeah. The in memoriam is always very touching. You know, we, we pay attention to that stuff throughout the year. Whenever we lose a legend, we try to say something about them, some kind of tribute personally, just cause you know, we like to do what we can to pay homage to these people. And when, you know, seeing, seeing them up on the screen, tallying the entire year of loss, it really puts it into perspective. I had forgotten about, you know, Robbie Coltrane and yeah. Kirstie Alley and John Luke Goddard and Bob Rafelson. And it was just, it was a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It kept, it kept going. And I was just like, fuck, man, it kept getting punched in the face. So uh, that, that was that was quality. Um, yeah, I guess we can start from the bottom here. I guess we'll start with the documentary short. Um, let's see. The Elephant Whispers took the win there. Uh, beating Hall Out? Hall Out, Hall yeah. Out, How Do You Measure a Year, The Martha Mitchell Effect, and... Stranger at the Gate. Stranger at the Gate. Yeah, the list we're using is like the smallest font in the world. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I might need glasses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I didn't get to see these. Uh, I know we had made a pact to watch all of the movies, but, you know, life gets in the way of a lot of things. And, you know... I've got a thesis. You've got a kid. It's just not feasible. So it's it's also financially not the greatest idea because uh, with the shorts, I'll, I'll admit, with the shorts, we probably could have done a little more work, and because a lot of them are on Netflix and YouTube, and uh, a couple of them are, are like on Apple TV Plus. But there are there are feature films in the other categories where I was I just didn't feel led to actually watch them. Yeah, you know, I, I my heart wasn't in it. Uh, there are a few that I really want to get to. Mainly the whale. I still haven't seen that. I really want to see Living. That movie looks really cool. So there are those ones I will get to just because I want to. Yes. But I'm not going to sh- you know, fucking go on a limb just to yeah. see something because it was nominated. I, I We're kind of done with that. <laughs> yeah. That whole mindset. The podcast reboot renders all previous packs made null and void. Also, that pact was made on sneak preview. So there you go. So that show's yeah, been dead that, for a long time. Yeah. We should have known when that show was dead. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That pact was dead. We did. We did do very good, though. I think yeah. I think I missed all in all. Not including the shorts. I think I missed like eight or nine feature films, you know, and that's like three of, of the foreign, from the foreign category, a couple documentaries. So we did really well. And there were, there were a few times where when the category, you know, when they named the nominees, I was like, oh, I've seen all these and it feels good, you know. It does. I, I missed about three documentaries, uh, four of the foreign films, as well as uh, Living, After Sun, To Leslie, and Causeway. But that, I've seen, I saw everything else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. For me, I need to see the whale. For you, you got to see After Sun. Uh, those are both like best best actor. One of those movies is very very for me, and one of those movies is very for you. So that's kind of a cool swap. My new m- mantra going forward is: if it's free, I will see. <laughs> After Sun, I still think you have to rent it. Then I will wait. And the whale, I was going to watch the whale actually um, on Sunday, like pr- you know, um, prior to the Academy Awards. It's still twenty dollars to to rent. Oh, that's horseshit. And it's been out for a long time, so I was like, I, I just can't do that. I, like, I, I have the twenty dollars, but I don't really like. I rather save that to see Scream in theaters. Yeah, you know what I'm saying, or John Wick Four when it comes out. Uh, but I, yeah, I do. I will see the whale one day. I will be buying that when it's out on Blu-ray. It will be in my Voodoo, and that's where you can watch. There it. you go. That's great. Uh, okay, so documentary short. Not only did Elephant Whisperers win, but we both predicted that would it, that it would win, so we went one one there. Uh, live action short. An Irish Goodbye took the win. We also both picked that. Uh, Ivalu, I think is how you say that. Yeah. Uh, uh, La Pupil. La Pupil. Night Ride and the Red Suitcase. Again, we haven't seen these. <laughs> the Irish Goodbye is just, or, or Un Irish Goodbye is just the one that I heard, had heard. You know, this is the one that's probably going to take it. So that was an easy pick. Animated short. Uh, same kind of case here. The Boy, the Mole. The Fox and the Horse. I had heard that was really, really, really good, and I definitely want to check these out. I love animated shorts. They can be 
quite freeing and like a really easy, you know, you know, five to 10 minutes of your time. So uh, that beat The Flying Sailor, Ice Merchants, My Year of Dicks. Definitely want to see that. And an ostrich told me the world is false and I think I believe it. Also want to see that because that's a fantastic title. I went with the year, my year of dicks just because I wanted to hear that announced <laughs> as a winner. Yeah. But, uh, and it's, it's like what it's about. You know, you don't have to like um, wonder what that. So it's about a, a, a woman's like year <sighs> of just escapades. Dicks. Yeah. That's uh, weird. I have a, a friend from high, from high school who wrote a book about that exact thing. It's a great idea. Yeah. It's a good way to kind of document how you've grown and also how, you know, maybe some dicks have grown around you. So I don't, I don't know. Personally, I'd be happy just to write a pamphlet. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Or watch a short. Uh, yeah. Maybe not write a whole book. Uh, let's see. So that's, we've done doc short, live action short, animated short. Let's, visual effects. Ah, yes. Okay. Visual effects. Here's four. I've seen four of these and I still haven't seen the winner. Avatar, Way of Water. Uh, I'm just not really into those movies. It's the only Best Picture nominee I didn't see. I saw it during the pact, and I was like, all right, it's here. I'm, yeah. I'll go. So At least you got to see it in theaters where it's like intended to be, and it, you know, it's, you can do that thing where you're like, whoa. I took two bathroom breaks, and I didn't miss anything. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, well, it is over three three hours. You know, Avatar is about the length of the ceremony tonight. That's yeah. pretty wild. Uh, it beat All Quiet on the Western Front, The Batman, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, and Top Gun Maverick. Uh, you got a couple sequels in there. You got Batman, which is kind of a sequel in its own way. Uh, and All Quiet on the Western Front, also a sequel in its own way. And, of course, the winner. So kind of interesting that all the visual effects movies are yeah. legacy or, you know, uh, sequels. There's zero originality in there at all. You got a, a remake, a sequel, a reboot, and two two more sequels. I, I'd say this is probably just me being biased, but I'd say the most original one is the Batman because it. I've never seen a Batman quite like it. I wish it would have won visual effects, but we knew all along. This is It's Cameron. Yeah. Bet on Cameron for visual effects. He may not be a very good dude, but God, the dude knows how to make a visually stunning motion picture. Yeah, exactly. So that, that was one of the shoe-ins, in my opinion. Uh, there was really no doubt about it. Had the highest odds in Vegas. Like it was just it was not even a contest. Uh, best sound. This is a good group. Uh, Top Gun Maverick took the win, beating Elvis, the Batman, Avatar the Way of Water, and All Quiet on the Western Front. Good group. Yeah, this was another kind of guarantee for me. Top Gun Mavericks, you know, the way it manipulates sound design, you know, for the Jets, I figured this was going to be the one they gave Top Gun some love. I, I knew it was going to get something. This was going to be that that one. Yeah, I mean, it was labeled the movie that, you know, saved Hollywood back in, you know, April, May, June. Is, let's, 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 call, let's cool off on that. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and say, because we're not going to have a whole lot of other moments to talk about Top Gun. I really liked it. I had a blast. You know, eight out of ten kind of movie. Just just had a blast at the theater by myself with a bunch of other you know older people. It was great. <laughs> Saw it on a huge giant screen at the Palladium in, uh, in San Antonio. Good stuff. Love, and I'm like one of those people who just I just love Tom Cruise. I love what he represents as far as like doing his own stunts and all the all of that on screen, off screen not so much. But <laughs> what's the difference between what Top Gun is doing? And what a lot of the other major, you know, money makers are doing, like an Avatar or a Marvel movie. It's just, it's just like, oh, here's this larger than life, almost comic book type guy, Maverick. They all have fucking nicknames, like Iceman, Maverick, and Goose. And, like, that's the same thing as, you know, Captain America and Thor and, like, all these different kind of almost wacky names that are made up. I, what's the difference? <laughs> but people want to give Top Gun that kind of credit. I, I, I Just because it used... Not as much CGI. I don't really get it. Here's what what bugs me. Back in December of 2021, Spider-Man No Way Home made like 100 mm. or 200 million more than Top Gun Maverick. Nobody said shit about Spider-Man saving the cinema. Top Gun comes along and Spielberg goes up to cruise at a party and is like, you saved all of us. You saved Hollywood. Like, dude, come on. Does this guy need any more ego boosts? He's going to explode. Yeah, if he hasn't already, you know. <laughs> He wasn't at the show. Maybe he, maybe yeah. his ego collapsed into itself. It really sucks. I wish he would have been there. He's just such a fascinating human being. And I, I, obviously it would have helped if he had been fucking nominated for lead actor. And I think more people probably would have tuned into the telecast if he was nominated. You know, he's one of those guys. But yeah, Spider-Man, that should have been up at the last Oscars. I think it should have been up for a lot of stuff. Yeah. Not only because it's awesome and it was like an amazing achievement financially and just a really good story. It, it, would, it gets people interested, you know? When you nominate movies that people actually see, 
it, it's going to help you out a little yeah. bit. And they had a lot of that this time. Yeah. Which was impressive. Um, next up, production design. Mm, yeah. I like this group. Yeah. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front took the win against Avatar, The Way of Water, Babylon, Elvis, and the Fablemans. Uh, yeah, Babylon was one of those, you know, Oscar bait movies that didn't quite make it. No. Got a couple of technical nominations, but that's it. And didn't win. No, did not win. No one's given the elephant shit movie a win. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They really, they didn't really get invited to the party, nor did they ever show anybody involved in Babylon, like Brad Pitt, I guess it wasn't there. Uh, Margot Robbie was there. She did, um, you know, her and Morgan Freeman had a nice little bit. I never saw Damien Giselle. Mm-hmm. I guess no one really showed up, you know, for that. Uh, Diego Calva. Also, which she would have been nominated, uh, kind of sucks. That's one of my favorite movies from the year. But I mean, yeah, it's one of those super divisive. Either you're totally turned off by it, or you you like it. Um, and there's some normal people like Connor who are kind of down the middle. <laughs> but uh, that that doesn't happen very often. So I, I wish it would have gone to Babylon, but all quiet. I get it. I mean, like those trenches. Jesus Christ! Like that movie is breathtaking uh, in the in the darkest way possible. I did keep laughing. Because All Quiet kept winning stuff, and they would play the brr, wah, wah, noise from the score yeah. every time. And it just sounded like the fucking Purge siren was going to go off. It does. It does. <laughs> uh, yeah. We'll talk about that later, because it won Best Score. It did, and I don't know about how I feel about that. Yeah. Uh, makeup and hairstyling. Uh, the win goes to the whale here, of course, for the you know prosthetic fat suit that Brendan Fraser is, is wearing throughout the entire film. Uh, it beat Elvis. Also, a lot going on there as far as makeup and hairstyling. And, of course, towards the end of the film, you know, Austin Butler is also in kind of a prosthetic fat suit. That's where I was like, holy shit, is that actually Elvis? <laughs> that was the moment of the movie that I was most impressed by. Uh, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, uh, The Batman, and All Quiet on the Western Front. Gotta love seeing The Batman uh, get, get a few noms here, you know. It's one of my favorite movies from the year. You know it's not going to win anything, but it's cool to have there, you know, at the party. Well, I thought it really did have a chance in this one because, you know, the – the makeup for Colin Farrell's Penguin oh. is fucking astonishing. Um, and he was there. He was there. You know, because he's nominated for Best Actor. So that, that was kind of, yeah, he had a great year. <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh, this is a great year for fat suits, really. It, it is. Uh, <laughs> my, I heard one guy say, uh, Brendan Fraser needs to thank Christian Bale for not taking on the role of the <laughs> whale because he would have actually gained the weight himself. <laughs> yeah, this would have killed him. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Jesus. Because Christian Bale, yeah, he he like refuses. He's like, no, I'll, I'll, I'll gain the weight myself. And it's like, you can't. I, <laughs> you physically cannot. I love that story so much when Christian Bale called Gary Oldman after Darkest Hour and was like, how did you gain all that weight? Like, and, and you know, pull like, that off. And Gary Oldman's like, it's a suit, Christian. And Christian's like, we can we can do that now? Like, yeah. It looks so real. And he had just done Vice. And now he's like, you know, irreparably healthily damaged because of that movie. Just, yeah, yeah, he does, you know, like American Hustle and then like something like Out of the Furnace where he's super skinny and, you know, and then he goes back to doing, yeah, it's it's insane. Oh, that guy's a freak. Um, but, you know, the whale, we both picked it. We both, you know, kind of believed like, hey, man, this is this is really impressive. You have a the whole movie is based around a character that is wearing something that makes it look very, very real, very authentic. Not just the term, like what it looked like, but the way he wore that suit. Yeah. The way he's walking around, like he has like 600 pounds dragging him down. You believed it. You know, that's going to, you know, that's half performance, half gear. And I'm glad this took that because it was a very thoughtfully constructed fat suit costume. Like it looked like a real person. Not, you know, it wasn't Eddie Murphy playing the clumps. This was the real deal. Yeah. Yeah, so hats off to them for getting that win. Uh, and of course, a big win later. Uh, film editing, which is a, a always a category that's very fascinating. Most of the time, it matches with the Best Picture winner. In this case, it, it did. Everything Everywhere All at Once took the win, beating the Banshees of Inisherin, Elvis, Tar, and Top Gun. Yeah, this was kind of a shoe in here. Everything Everywhere All at Once does not make sense unless it is yeah. edited perfectly. And it was, because everyone was on board. Uh yeah, I thought, you know, Tar, probably its closest uh, competition here. I actually, I actually thought Elvis. Really? Because it's a, you know, it's a Baz Luhrmann film where everything's just fucking, you know, on, on crack and moving around so fast. Okay. I thought maybe, it's not only my kind of cup of tea, um, but like Baz is not my kind of filmmaker, but I do respect some of the, you know, the, the cutting that goes on in, in his movies, specifically Elvis with some of the kind of montage scenes of Elvis, because they... They move through the years throughout the, throughout that movie. It's like a two and a half hour movie, but it covers decades of, of you know of, of life. 
and I do find that re- that's probably really difficult. Um, so I, I thought that had a chance. Uh, Banshees, I don't know. Banshees just feels like, hey, it's one of the best movies of the year. So let's you know throw it film editing. I wasn't blown away by the cutting of. It's a pretty still camera, yeah. just kind of you know point and shoot movie, which is fine. Top Gun probably pretty tough to make. Yeah, I'll give it that. Yeah, editing together the flying sequences and all that. Yeah, that was a. Uh, yeah, like the the dog fights in the air, like. Yeah, it can't be very easy to, to make. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but yeah, er, again, everything I roll at once is a multiverse film. Yeah, when you're cutting together scenes from like 50 different universes into a coherent narrative, that's impressive work. Yeah, extre- extremely impressive. Uh, costume design, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever takes the win. Uh, Ruth Carter, she gave a really really cool speech. Uh, beating Babylon, Elvis, everything I roll at once, and Mrs. Harris goes to Paris. This is there, that's one that I actually watched on a whim. <laughs> kind of cute. Leslie Manville is great in that movie. Um, I thought I thought all of these movies had great costume design. This is a stacked category for me, and it not like Mrs. Harris goes to Paris is like a typical. Uh, it's got a lot of you know it's a it's a period piece, so it's got a lot of you know big gowns and you know different kind of like three piece suits for the men. Everything all at once is a really unique kind of costume design movie, and again you have like a different worlds that they're going to. Elvis obviously they're basically replicating stuff that actually happened, and it looks almost you know identical. Black Panther, it you know deserves all the praise that it gets for that category because uh, I mean it's just mesmerizing. Every whatever he's wearing in Wakanda and, and Babylon is really cool. Like some of the stuff that they have Margot Robbie wearing is is incredible stuff. So I, I thought this is like one of the more legit categories where all five movies had a chance. I had something to say. Yeah, you're right. Um, Mrs. Harris goes to Paris deals with fashion, right? Yes, she she goes to Paris because she wants to buy. A specific, uh, not a specific dress, but she wants to go to a certain dressmaker, mm-hmm. and she wants to buy a dress that's like her dream. It's really cute because it's like an older, older woman still trying to chase something that she's been wanting to do for years. She finally gets the opportunity and the money to do it, and so I was really pulled in by it. I, I, I don't, you know, I don't think a lot of people have seen it, but I was, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I was into that movie, and I thought it was really cute. You know, solid, solid, like seven point five out of ten. You know, good stuff. Well, I figured, you know. When in doubt, bet on the movie about fashion. Yeah. Because those typically tend to take this category For sure. almost every time. But, you know, the first Black Panther also took costume design. Yes, same, same woman, yeah. Yeah, so I figured, you know, that was a safe bet because she is fucking amazing in what she creates with Wakanda. And, and then they brought in um, uh, Namor and uh, the... Yeah. Uh, what are they called? Uh, I... I keep wanting to say Atlanteans because that's what it is in the but comic. Not, but yeah, it's not in it's the something movie. else. Uh, yeah. I can't fucking remember. I know it didn't stick. <laughs> I didn't. I I really didn't like love that movie. I I was brought to tears because of the Bozeman stuff, the Charlie yeah. Bozeman stuff. But I thought like point A to point B, like they they missed a lot of like cool opportunities. Yeah. But shit, it's got to be fucking hard when you're going on the fly after losing the yeah. movie. They had a plan. I mean, Chadwick, like- Chadwick, and Michael B were the movie, the first one. I mean, yeah. they. Well, it's basically just king versus king, and you're like, well, there you go. I mean, it's very easy to build a story around that. When he died, they had to kind of, you know, audible and do different things, and you could you could feel it. Yeah, like there's some leftovers in Wakanda Forever. Like Ironheart does not feel like she was supposed to be in this movie. No, no. And it's the film suffers because of that. And Phase Four had problems. We talked about that a lot. It's you know, it's unfortunate, but hey. But at the end of the day, the movie look looks damn impressive, and that's that's a lot to do with what people are wearing and. How it's presented so yes cinematography one, one of my favorite categories uh, every year it's just so cool the kind of movies that get get uh you know some recognition here and there's two movies that only have one nomination at the entire ceremony and that's bardo and empire of light and you've got uh i think darius Con- kanji is his name for uh bardo and of course roger deacons for empire of light so those are kind of like all stars when it comes to people being behind, being behind the camera but all Quiet on the Western Front also won this category, uh, and Elvis was up, and Tar. This is this is a good category. Some of these movies look really, really good. You know, Empire of Light. Ah, it was like the most Oscar bait movie of the year, but <laughs> yeah. it still looked really cool and had some really cool moments. Uh, I was kind of shocked Olivia Coleman wasn't up for Best Actress just because they they love her. They do, but that movie stumbled. It it didn't big time. Yeah, it didn't pull off what it wanted to pull off. It's Sam Mendes' worst movie. But I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, he, that man's done so many masterpieces. That's that it's still really... it's still not like a train wreck. No, you know, there's still like like I the whole um, 
I won't give away like the whole thing, but the the storyline of her of Olivia Coleman's character working in a movie theater, but like not having seen a movie in the theater yet, yeah. and then towards the end of the movie she starts kind of questioning that. I was really moved by that storyline, but there's other kind of side yeah. plots that just. Why are we also shoving, you know, 80s uh, ska culture and, like, racism into this story about yeah. Olivia Coleman finding herself? Mm. It just didn't work. But, you know, Deacons can do no wrong. It looked great. Uh, but All Quiet was going to take Oof. this. Yeah. Uh, James Friend, just <laughs> yeah. look out for this dude. He's not that old. He's got a lot of path in front of him. He's mainly worked on, like, epic TV shows. I was looking at his IMDb. I was like, how do I not know who this guy is? But... Because he hasn't done a ton of feature films, I expect that to change from here on out. He he's got a clear hold on what he wants to do. Um, there was clearly a great kind of partnership with that movie because it you know it won it won a handful of awards tonight and uh, good for, good for that movie. I, I I liked it a lot. Bardo, this is it for you know this is this is an Alejandro Iñárritu movie that's Mex it's a Mexican production and it wasn't even up for international feature. You also have the uh, decision to leave that wasn't up for international feature. Really odd that they would leave out these kind of heavy hitters when it comes to, you know, international cinema. But, you know, if the if the product isn't as good as they think the others are, I, I don't know. I've heard Decision to Leave is incredible. And so <clears throat> Bardo is an acquired taste. It is not for everybody. Uh, I enjoyed it. That's because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I like pretentious stuff uh, sometimes. And I, I really like Inuritu. You know, I, I'll go to bat for him kind of any day. And I thought that was like a cool, uh, you know, like retrospective type type movie on his own career. It feels like a lot of guys are doing that now nowadays. I think every filmmaker at some point wants to do that. But again, All Quiet was kind of going to take this, you know, no matter what. I do think Tar looks fucking amazing. Elvis at times does look fucking amazing. So this is not a bad category, but there have been years past where I thought the cinematography category was much better. Yeah. I'm I'm very surprised everything everywhere all at once was not in here, mm. uh, considering that well, the way that movie was filmed is pretty unique. Um, yeah, Bardo, <laughs> I uh, two and a half hours. This, roughly. this is it. This is your only chance to really talk about it. Yeah, so. this is it. Um, I'm putting this in the back pocket after um, two and a half to two forty. I think it was. Uh, I made yeah. it about halfway through. Didn't know what the fuck was going on. And consciously made an effort to just say, I've had enough. I turned it off. I rated it. I moved on. I don't plan on going back to it. I I don't I don't like self-indulgent, yeah. look at me, I'm an artist movies. And that's what it is. Uh, yeah. But at least Spielberg had a story to tell with his. S- yeah, Spielberg's always going <clears> to, <throat> he's always going to have that thing in the back of his pocket that's like, well, I, I am the American storyteller, so, you know, you, you just kind of shut up and listen. After you give me Jaws and Indiana Jones, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I don't it, care. And Yuritu doesn't quite have that <laughs> filmography. Uh, I do love some of his movies, though, man. You know, I'm um, you know, a big, big Birdman fan, big uh, Amor Los Perros fan. You know, I like uh, Revenant's cool. Uh, Babel, right? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. What's the other one I missed? 21, 21 Grams is cool. Yeah. I, li- I like pretty much all of his movies, so... Uh, all right. Original song. So all of these were performed at some point throughout the telecast. Uh, the winner is Natu Natu, the RRR song that just is sweeping the entire world. Uh, I haven't seen that movie. I, I do want to see it. Um, I was kind of, you know, on and off about it, like uh, kind of on the fence. And then I heard someone talk about that there's one particular scene involving kind of, I think it's a train. And they said it's one of the most brilliant choreographed scenes like they've ever witnessed. I was like, okay, I think I need to check that out. <laughs> uh, I, it's on Netflix. I think what's been holding me back is the runtime and that I haven't quite taken the dive into Bollywood films. And I'm like, oh, that's another door that I'm opening. <laughs> and I know if I like it, I'm going to want to watch a bunch of other stuff. So I'm, I'm always kind of scared to do that, but it's also exciting. So I, I do want to see that movie. And that was a cool you know, the total banger, that, that whole, that whole bit was fun. Um, it beat applause from tell it like a woman, which I don't think I've met anyone that's seen that movie. I would like to check it out. Just don't really know where to watch it. Uh, you got hold my hand. Uh, that's the lady Gaga song from top gun Maverick, uh, lift me up uh, by Rihanna from black Panther, Wakanda forever. And this is a life, uh, David Byrne and Stephanie Sue, uh, from everything everywhere all at once. 
you know, these were fun. Like watching them, you know, was cool. When you get, again, when you get a chance to have Rihanna and Lady Gaga at the Oscars on stage, you, you just have to do it. Yeah. And their performances were beautiful. Yeah. They were both very in, into it, doing uh, kind of an acoustic rendition of their songs, which was beautiful. And then David Byrne with the hot dog fingers was just delightful. Fantastic. Yeah. And yeah, Not Too Not Too looked fun. <laughs> and it was a great song. It was catchy. Yeah. And the performance was just, you know, a Bollywood style dance routine with the, with the song. And yeah, that movie, I remember hearing about it. It just like, was like a wildfire. It just, it was a little bit and then a little bit more and then a lot. And then it got Golden Globes attention and then it got Oscars attention. It was just this crazy journey this movie's had. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy for its success. It's Bollywood's first ever Academy Award. So yeah, pretty cool. Right. Uh, so yeah, I, who knows? Maybe we'll check it out and we'll kind of change our minds about, about Bollywood altogether and, and go down that path. Original score, All Quiet on the Western Front took the win, beating Babylon. Uh, that was my, my baby, Babylon. She's got nothing. <laughs> uh, the Banshees of Inishirin, Everything Everywhere All at Once, and The Fablemans. It's a pretty good, pretty good group. You know, you got some, I mean, fucking John Williams. The dude's almost 100. And here he is, you know, with another Spielberg collaboration. They said it was his 53rd nomination. Like, <laughs> fuck. I do, I do love the, the joke that Kimmel said, and you've only won five. Like, that's actually not very good. <laughs> five of 53 is uh, is not the best uh, batting average, you know. But but damn, 53 nominations. He's he's one of the the titans, uh, not only with the Oscars, but just in general. So good to see him. He looks happy. Yeah. The guy's still still hanging out. Um, I, I wanted this to go to Babylon. I just think that's such an awesome, jazzy, you know, score. It's right up my alley. Justin Hurwitz, I love that guy. Also did the Whiplash and La La Land. Um uh, scores so I was pulling for that but uh, you know you voted everything ever all at once great great score but All Quiet takes it the bam 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 you know the constant kind of you know it was unsettling while you're watching the yeah. film like because it would come at kind of strange moments and you're like oh god here comes something horrible well it feels like shell shock and that's what yes what he was going for was like this is the the vibration going through a soldier's head when he's you know about to run into battle and in that case, well done. Yeah. But, you know, everything everywhere all at once was a lot more experimental and a lot more, you know, bizarre. Yeah. But the film that I think deserved this wasn't even up. And I think this 100% should have gone to Michael Giacchino for the Batman. The Batman, yep. Yeah. Yep. Dude, I was listening to, that's really funny that you brought that up. Uh, I feel the same way. I was listening, when I, before I came to, to y'all's house to watch the Oscars, I was uh, taking a shower and just kind of, cleaning up a little bit. I was listening to the Batman score <laughs> and I was just kind of like, man, and it wasn't like, you know, uh, ironic or anything. I wasn't doing it out of spite. I was just listening to it. Cause I like to listen to it. I think it's a cool kind of getting ready, you know, fucking score. Like it kind of puts you in this like, Oh fuck. Yeah. Like kind of mood. <laughs> and, and then I was thinking, I was like, man, how is this not nominated? You know, it's, it's one of those just total misses in my opinion, but, uh, it's not there. And, all Quiet on the Western Front just racks up another win. Every Batman score has been amazing and unique and has never gotten any awards attention. Danny Elfman's 89 score was fucking beautiful. The, oh. the, the blueprint for Batman. Maybe my favorite. Yeah. yeah, Shirley Walker's score for Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Beautiful. Piggybacking off of Elfman, creating something her own. Hans Zimmer Hans and James Newton Howard yeah. for Batman Begins. Epic, cool reboot. Even the Goldenthal score from Batman Forever, pretty neat. Yeah. And then you've got even Tom Zimmer for, you know, again, for um, Batman v Superman. Cool. You know, the, the bit beautiful lie. I always love that. And now you got Michael Giacchino. And every time it's like, it's a cool reinvention of the character and they get dick. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. It's quite, quite frustrating. Right. Um, <laughs> I don't know, man. I just, well, we can dream. Can't we? <laughs> We're going to have to. Yeah. Uh, best documentary. We both saw two. Uh, I saw three. You saw two of these. Yes. Uh, Navalny took the win. We we kind of knew that was coming. Beating uh, all that breathes, all the beauty and the bloodshed, fire of love, and a house made of splinters. We both watched Fire of Love on Disney Plus, and I checked out All That Breathes on HBO Max. I do intend on seeing the other two because I love. I just love my docs. Uh, all that breathes is very very slow, um, but it it moved me. If you're in the right mood. If you're ready for it, it can move you. Fire of Love, also very slow, kind of an acquired taste. Navalny is a classic. We know the perspective. We understand it. It doesn't, it's not, doesn't take rocket science to understand 
wow, what this guy's going through is bullshit. Um, Russia, <laughs> Putin is quite frankly just fucked up. And we understand that, you know, from the get-go. We already knew that before the doc starts. So you, you just have a, you have a clear footing of where you're at. And there's a moment in that doc that is maybe one of the best scenes from any movie from the year 2022. And there's, it's this kind of natural, organic, caught in the act moment <laughs> that just will have your jaw on the floor. You know, you're just like, oh my God, like they, they actually accomplished this, you know, and it's on fucking camera. You watch it unfold live. It, it is incredible. And the ending, it will make you just fucking squirm and get so angry. It's just what a doc should do, you know? Um, it's not super complex. It doesn't have like incredible filmmaking. It's just a good doc, good story that people need to hear. Yeah, the political doc should inform and infuriate. Yes. And no, hearing about this guy's story, Alexei Navalny, who had the balls to stand up to a tyrannical dictatorship who tried to kill him and failed. Yeah. And then he went back. Like this, I wish I believed in anything as strongly as this guy believes in his country. Yeah. And I was just in awe. I'm so glad this won. Yeah, yeah, me too. I, I think it's I think it's a must see. Uh, I definitely recommend it on, on HBO Max for anybody who wants to check it out. I I do. I also think he, he like he's fascinating because he did some kind of shady stuff himself because he had to getting some pretty pretty like racist people on board in Russia because he needed numbers. Yeah, I mean he, he he kind of I don't know. That's really tough. And like that's a hard thing to get your mind wrapped around. But he was trying to see the bigger picture of like I I have to get to power. I absolutely have to. I have to become a, a straight up politician and start going against, you know, the regime. So I, I don't know. I just think it's thought provoking and really well done. And he's a he's a fascinating human being. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think we could talk about this one forever. Um, we probably could. Uh, yeah. The decisions he's had to make, you know, when the, when the Nazi party <sighs> is the lesser of two evils. Yeah. You're in a shit situation isn't that yeah wasn't that crazy i was like wait a minute is this really happening like <laughs> when the guy's like so are you like are you okay with using nazis on your side of the board here and he had he was just like i if they're if they'll help me <laughs> like i don't like it but it's what i gotta do yeah like you have to understand that i also have to play the game here yeah. or I, or or there's no point the so. bits when they were telling like he was trying to get him to say like you know if things don't work out is there something you'd like to say and he's like i'm not saying anything because i don't want you know you I'm not going to die. Like you keep frame it, phrasing this, like I'm going to die. Yeah. And he just didn't want to say anything to like jinx himself. Yeah. Incredible. And, and when they, when the, the filmmaker and the kind of the crew went up to accept the award tonight, his wife was there. What she said was really moving, you know, cause he's, you know, he's still stuck. So yeah. Uh, yeah. God, good stuff. I, uh, I've heard all the bloody and the beauty shed, all the beauty and the bloodshed is, is like incredible. I, I need to check that one out. Um, so I, I'm always on the lookout for docs. You know, I'm always, always ready. I love that category. Uh, animated feature. Another category I adore. It's the first award of the night. They got, they got, they got the ball rolling quick. And I, I, I liked that. I don't love putting animated feature first. I like kind of building that up a little bit more, but we knew Pinocchio was going to win. You know, Guillermo del Toro, he's just an icon and everybody loves him. And he made a very, very fascinating stop motion picture that looks incredible. Uh, it is kind of mixed on um, if people actually enjoyed the content, you know, the story. <laughs> I enjoyed it a lot, but I know you were kind of kind of bored at times. I was. It looks amazing. I I love Guillermo del Toro and everything he's given us. I just thought, you know, Pinocchio in, you know, fascist Italy singing poop songs to Mussolini was <laughs> was an odd creative decision, and I didn't really. I was. It kind of lost me with that. Uh, I was pulling for Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. I really yeah. wanted that. Yeah, see, I haven't seen that yet. All right, that's the only one of this group I haven't seen. Uh, Marcel, the sh uh, the shell with the shoes on is it is interesting. I get it. Like, I, I'm not I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, this is fucking dumb or whatever. Like, I understand like what what what's going what's going on. I understand kind of the kind of existential moments that Marcel has as this little tiny thing and you know realizes how big the world is. It's, there's some cute stuff in there, and I definitely want to show it to my daughter at some point when she's a little little older to understand kind of the the philosoph you know, philosophy behind it. Uh, Puss in Boots, I haven't seen that. I can't wait. It's on Peacock now. You can check it out. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, shit. Mm -hmm. when, when did that start? I think a couple days ago. Fuck. Yeah, I wish I would have seen it before, but 
I, I will, yeah, I can't wait to watch that. I've heard nothing but great things. The Sea Beast? I was blown away by the Sea Beast. I thought I was going to be bored and kind of checked out. No, I was on the edge of my seat during that one. I, I thought it was great. And Turning Red. Turning Red is one of the most creative and unique Pixar movies, and that's really saying something. Yeah. It is, I thought that movie was epic and came out like last April and it's just kept kept going, kept going, had this, had this you know, steam going for it. And I love Turning Red. So if I if I had to really choose, I'd probably go with Turning Red. My I've watched that with my daughter like 40 times already. <laughs> and every time I'm laughing my ass off and I'm also in tears and I'm like, man, I, I can't wait to keep watching this with my daughter as she gets older and she can start relating more to the characters. I, just incredible stuff. So this is a good group. I was I was like pleasantly surprised. I know I'm gonna like Puss in Boots, but I was pleasantly surprised with the other four. Yeah, Turning Red was a game changer for Pixar in terms of content. I mean, that was the first time I'd ever heard like a period mentioned in yeah. a in an anime in like a kids movie. But it's perfect because you know there shouldn't be a stigma around things like that. It's part of life. And yeah, I, the the there was a, a theme of like erasing parental trauma in 2022 with a lot yeah. of films. Like, don't you know? Don't embrace the bullshit that, you, that your parents had to force on you. Forge your own path in life and try to make them see that things can be different. Yeah. And yeah, Turning Red was kind of the first one to start start that trend. That was great, you know, but I, I do kind of like seeing Pixar lose just a little bit. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I hear you on that. So yeah, it's cool to see a super unique stop motion picture win, win this award over Pixar, over you know, DreamWorks, you know, over A24. <laughs> uh, and Sea Beast is also Netflix. So good, good stuff. And Gilmore, when he went up, it's just like, man, I just want to give that guy a hug. I know. He's he's got, he won another Oscar. I think that makes three for him now. Like he, he got director and picture for Shape of Water. Yeah. And now he's got animated feature. That's for cool. Yeah. Enters a special class of yeah three time Oscar winner. That's that's unique. <laughs> International feature. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front took the win. There was no no question about it. Like I mean, it's anytime a International feature is up for best picture. I mean, come on, you know you you know it's gonna win. Yeah. Uh, it beat Argentina, 1985, which is on Amazon Prime right now. Uh, Close, don't think that's available yet on streaming. Uh, EO, which is available on the Criterion channel. And The Quiet Girl, which I also don't think is available yet. But uh, I, I watched EO, thought it was awesome. About a, about a donkey. Just like going through some some traumatic stuff. Uh, but also kind of, you know, finding its way. And it's just a very unique film. But all quiet, come on, you know, I mean... There was really no competition unless they would have nominated Decision to Leave. Mm. That was the only like other big international feature that had, you know, had some some waves behind it. Just wasn't just wasn't up. Didn't have the didn't have the right amount of waves uh soon enough, you know. So You know, I wonder if that has anything to do with uh Chan Wook Park's like foundation and genre film. It very well could. Yeah. yeah. Very well. That's sad. It is sad, but it's unfortunately it's, it happens. <laughs> it's it's kind of the truth. Like look at John Carpenter. Yeah, no. it uh, took Guillermo del Toro a long fucking time to be recognized. Yeah, he just never gave up on like what he wanted to do, and you know, hats off to him. But yeah, that was an easy category. We all knew All Quiet was going to win, and know. it did deserve it. it was oh, a, it's a fantastic it's, movie. It's an amazing, dramatic, tense fucking movie about just a complete loss of innocence in a war that nobody really understands why it's being fought. World War One is one of the most complex wars to explain. You can't, you can't, you gotta like sit down for yeah. a while. It's like these two countries had a beef and then these other countries were allies so they had to get involved and then people forgot what the beef was and then Germany came out the bad guy. It, it's so fucking crazy. And everyone who was fighting in this was just told to fight. They didn't know why. They were just told, you know, those people are the enemy, kill them and millions died unnecessarily. It's a, it's a fucking travesty. Yeah, yeah, it's such a, it's got so many different layers to a different perspectives and it, it honestly makes for good filmmaking because it can do that loss of innocence, that kind of what the fuck are we doing? We're literally in hell type thing. Yeah. Uh, One of the and, best remakes I've ever seen. Oh yeah. <laughs> just, just incredible. Yeah, and he, what's the main guy's name? I, um, he, he, he's like unbelievable. Yeah. I, I would have loved to see him up for best lead actor. I thought he was unreal. The transformation from the beginning where he's kind of like, Jojo Rabbit style, like da 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 da, like I can't wait to fight for my nation. And then by the end of the movie, he's got just this shit all over his face. His eyes are bloodshot, and he's you know he's he's bleeding out. Like it's just incredible like, what happens to him throughout the movie, and uh, very very dark. I understand why someone wouldn't want to watch this because it's basically a horror movie, <laughs> and it's a little too real. But if you have the stomach for it, if you like you know you enjoy war films, it's 
very unique perspective. Um, adapted screenplay. Here we go. I, I, I love these screenplay categories, man. Uh, you got Women Talking, the win, Sarah Polly, hats off to her. Uh, beating Top Gun Maverick, Living, Glass Onion, a Knives Out story, a Knives Out mystery, and All Quiet on the Western Front. This is an interesting category. You know, Women Talking, kind of felt like this was the award that it was going to get. It was only up for this in Best Picture, and we knew it wasn't going to win Best Picture. So it kind of felt like this was, you know, it was Sarah's all, all night. It was, and she deserved it. It's a very interesting way to do a a feminist movie uh, telling a story that feels like it takes place in like the 1600s, yeah. but really was like 10 years ago, which is fucking insane. Uh, tr- using men as this kind of ethereal, intangible boogeyman creature that's going to come and, you know, rape and kill them if they don't figure out a solution here. Yeah. And it just works. It, you just feel for them. You, you understand where this is coming from and what they're trying to fix. And, you know, it's just, it's a rewarding film, but it's a, it's a hard film. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if someone were to start it and kind of give up on it. Cause it's just not their thing. I, I would understand. I I was, I was like you, we, we both love just like really, really good screenplays. And there are moments in this where Rooney Mara, Claire Foy, Jesse Buckley, or Fra- Francis McDormand are all just bang, 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 bang. And it's breathtaking. If you like that talky, talky philosophical type stuff, I get why some people would be turned off by it. I was not. And I love Sarah Pauly. She's so cool. What she said was so badass about, oh, I thought the Academy would be scared of the two words, women and talking being next to each other. <laughs> that was one of my favorite moments uh, of kind of rebellion during the telecast. So yeah, good, good win. I never really felt like it was going to lose. So um, that, you know, that's adapted screenplay. Original screenplay, on the other hand, five bangers. Like this is, this is a, as usual, original screenplay, like it just delivered. Uh, Banshees of Inner Sheeran, Everything Ever Well at Once, The Fablemans, Tar, and Triangle of Sadness, all Best Picture nominees, all movies that I really enjoyed. Uh, Everything Ever Well at Once took the win, though. Um, and this is where you could feel, oh, it's going to go ahead and take film editing and it's going to take Best Picture. Yeah, this was, it was nice seeing the Daniels keep going up there yeah. and getting to, you know, thank and just embrace this crazy spotlight for this movie that you know, they thought it was too crazy to work and just, you know, finding the right production company to take a chance on this, you know, saved this movie and created a best picture winner. Uh, Which is the first for A24 since Moonlight. Yeah. I think so. I think you're right. Yeah. Green Book, no. <laughs> uh, Shape of Water, no. Uh, Parasite, no. That was Neon. Uh, Nomadland, no. Um, and Coda. Was Apple? Oh yeah, Coda. No, yeah. So yeah, Moonlight and now everything all at one, all at once, you know. And two, two deserving films. Yeah, A twenty four has really turned into a powerhouse production company for it got independent the, film. I it love got it. the best advertising tonight. <laughs> I heard A twenty four more times than the Will Smith slap uh, thank, reference. Thank God. Like A twenty four, and that's great. That's great for it. You know, I know some people like are kind of getting tired of the A twenty four shtick. I don't care. I, I I love like about half the movies they put out. I adore. I don't care for their horror output. Their horror output is a lie, but their yeah. drama output is amazing. I agree. <laughs> I understand that because a lot of it's just kind of, you know, just this psychological, like more thriller, I guess. Drama, thriller. But man, they still have given us, you know, The Witch and The Lighthouse and Hereditary. Like they still have given us amazing genre films. And now we can add everything or everything all at once to one of the most unique genre films that we've had in the past few years to that list. So I'm grateful for them. I'd rather not, I'd rather be a glass half full guy on A20, <laughs> on A24. They do have some annoying kind of traits about their movies and the way they kind of market stuff is can get a little, yeah. can get a little annoying. Like the way they marketed like Midsommar or Lamb or, you know, some of those quote unquote, you know, horror movies, it, it, it gets a little old. I, I understand that, but I'm still moved by a lot of their films and you know it's it's a dis, distrib, uh, distribution company it's not a you know they're not the director <laughs> it's true and i but there's a consistent vibe there with is everything they green light so i don't know how hands-off they really are dimly lit <laughs> very dimly lit stuff yeah and let's... i think they got a representative on set to make sure that the colors are right <laughs> it's some 25 year old guy who's just like hey i know what's in <laughs> yeah He's never Always. seen anything before, like, 2012. 
Yeah. Yeah, which is, uh, that's funny because that's the year A24 came to fruition. There so 2012, 2013, and here they are now, 10 years later. Pretty incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's yeah, that's, that's huge. A screenplay win for, for A24 and for the, the Daniels. So yeah, yeah, it was really, really neat watching them keep going back. They're such a fun pair. Those guys are, those guys are great. Yeah. I like seeing, you know, just people who love movies get it rewarded like this. God, me too, man. That like, I don't know. My mom was texting me during the telecast and she was like, it's cool to see so many people just grateful. Yeah. Just grateful. And like, like the way Brendan Fraser was just hyperventilating mm. and, you know, different people that went up there. Michelle Yeoh was just, just grateful for the moment. I, I, I love that, you know, cause sometimes you get some of these Hollywood dickheads who just feel like they deserve everything. Even the producer who took Best Picture win was like, I'm so happy for this. Like, yeah, and he was like, I don't know what to say. We won Best Picture. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, that's... that's. It wasn't some suit up, you know, down the road who's like, yep, I'll just put this in my collection. Uh, see ya. Yeah. No, it was great. <laughs> it was good. It, it, it feels like... I don't know. I know I know. not a ton of people watch the Oscars. And I know, like that producer said for Everything Ever All at Once, and Daniel, one of the Daniels said, I can't remember which one, said like, this, this is all pretty silly, you know? Like... <laughs> And Jimmy Kimmel said it too at the, his first monologue. He was like, "Look, like, like making movies, like it, it's it's awesome, but it's also like you have to understand there's like a fine line." And I, I thought, I, I think a lot of these filmmakers and these creators and these um, artists understand that. I feel like a lot of people yeah. in the a lot of people in the audience understand like what what it means to bridge the gap between audience members and the artists themselves. Like Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson just kind of like messing with each other, like ah, you know. When they made the Irish joke and they were like, oh, you know, that just, it just feels like those are the kind of people we need to be celebrating, you know? Well, the people who are winning are, you know, the, a new generation of people who grew up with, you know, other films and have kind of realized how tongue in cheek it all really is. And the people who are from the previous generation who tagged along with this are the people who accept that and are able to adapt. Mm. And now we, we're getting a better industry that understands that they're basically making money playing make believe. Yeah. And I love that. I love that it's not that serious anymore. That we're just celebrating art for art's sake, and everyone's on board with that. It feels great. Yeah, it does. If yeah, I, I've heard a couple of people say that right now movies are winning. Like, yeah. It really does feel like okay, we're getting back to that 2018, 2019 zone of all right. There's a lot of quality shit. And also cool ass people making it, you know. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good fucking feeling. And I'll, you know, I throw a lot of shit to A twenty four for their marketing and for their horror output, but they are a big part of why we're getting this new kind of film. Yeah. And because they're greenlighting a lot of independent projects and giving people an opportunity to tell stories that would otherwise not be told by bigger studios. And I'm all for inclusion and originality and new shit. So props to A twenty four for giving a damn. Yeah, I mean, it, it won a ton of stuff. Yeah. Tonight, thanks to the whale and to everything, everyone all at once. Uh, let's see. Uh, best actress in a supporting role. Awesome, awesome group. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, <laughs> quite possibly the steal of the night. I think all along, everyone thought that Angela Bassett, like this was her Oscar to win. I, I don't know. I just had this feeling on, <laughs> sun, on Sunday morning. I was kind of looking at stuff online and I was like, I don't know. I think Jamie Lee might have kind of passed her in the approval rating. Uh, I love Angela Bassett. I would have no problem with her winning. I I probably like Angela a little bit more as a performer. I wouldn't have voted for either of them if I were voting. I would have voted Stephanie Sue. I thought she was the best part of um, everything, everywhere all at once. But, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis is there. Usually they cancel each other out if two people from the same movie are in the same category. But Jamie Lee Curtis won, man. And her, her she had her moment. It was cool. Watching her just shout out, you know, like, I've been in all these, you know, genre films and, I've done horror movies and they've, I've never gotten nominated and here I am. Like I won. And she was like, mom, dad, I won. Like it was so special. It was, I was not expecting this. And I love that she shouted out horror fans who've kind of kept the faith yeah. since Halloween. Cause you know, that means the world, you know, these are, you know, horror gets, it doesn't get to play in the sandbox. So when 45 years, man, unbelievable. It's, yeah. a, it's amazing. And her parents were, you know, Janet Lee and Tony Curtis uh, past nominate nominees. And to say, you know, Mom, Dad, I won an Oscar. That was fucking beautiful. Yeah, it was. I'm so happy for her. Because uh, when she was nominated, I remember seeing the pictures of her, like, shocked that she was even considered. Yeah. And now she won Academy Award winner Jamie Lee Curtis. Here That's she fucking is. awesome. Here she is, yeah. Good stuff. <laughs> so she won. She beat uh, her fellow co-star, Stephanie Sue. 
uh, Carrie Condon from uh, Banshees of Inner and Hong Chow, who's just look the fuck out for her uh, oh, in the God. whale. She was also like the best part of the menu, um, <laughs> which is also on HBO Max now. Uh, and Angela Bassett for Black Panther Wakanda Forever. So this is a good group, like good, solid group of women, good diversity. This is a, for me, this is the ideal category. Yeah, I agree. It was kind of anyone's game. Uh, I'm excited to see what Carrie Condon and Hong Chow do next. Uh-huh. Uh, especially Hong Chow and the Whale is such a broken character. Her, I won't reveal like her relationship to Brendan Fraser because it's a big moment. Okay. But just, it's so touching and you just, there's this kind of sense of loyalty that she wished to God she didn't have. Ah. And it's, it's fucking beautiful. Uh, and then Carrie Condon is just this like, the voice of reason in an it's island very nice. where everyone's a fucking idiot. <laughs> and she's just like, why are you doing this? Yeah. And she's like, I got to get out of here. Got to get a real job. She's, yeah, she's great. The whole cast for Banshees is lights out. Uh, so, but they got nothing. Yeah. Got shut out. I thought at the very least, McDonough was going to get director or screenplay just to. Nothing. For, yeah. Nothing at all. For, for what I think is maybe the best overall movie of 2022. Nothing. <laughs> for banshees so that's that sucks it's not my favorite but i i do think it's i think 20 years from now it's going to be one of those like criterion like, at the rate the criterion channel's going it'll probably be in there like next oh week. yeah yeah I, I i think not only will it get you know selected but it'll be one that'll kind of last like it'll deserve that spot like i think triangle of sadness is already there yeah like <laughs> um like for example a couple years ago one night in miami went into the criterion collection it was like I, I love Regina King. I think it's a good movie, but I kind of jumped the gun on that one. They gotta let shit breathe. They yeah. cast like a, a year, the same year it comes out, getting recognized in Criterion is ridiculous. Like The Irishman got it immediately, yeah. and I don't think anybody That's, actually watched it before most, they did that. Mostly because of Scorsese, he's yeah. done so much for that streaming service and so much for the the kind of preservation of film. Yeah, that they're just kind of like. Here you go. Well, then maybe put, you know... Goodfellas. Goodfellas, <laughs> Taxi Driver, Gangs of New York, yeah. any any of those deserving films. I don't know. It's so weird Cape how... Fear, perhaps. It's so weird how, like, nine David Cronenberg films are in the... And, and every David Lynch film is in, you know, the Criterion Collection, but, like, Paul Thomas Anderson doesn't ha has one. I think the Coens just have Miller's Crossing. Yeah, it's like... What? Oh, and Blood Simple. There yeah. has to be a reason for all that, you know? Like, like how the fuck is No Country for Old Men not... <laughs> You know, there has to be something that we don't know, but we've talked about that before. Um, actor in a supporting role. Was this the best moment? Oh, my God. It it was in, until, for me, until Fraser took it. But to see fucking Short Round become an Academy Award winner and just be intensely grateful was beautiful. Yeah. K.O. Kwan took it for everything, everywhere, all at once after taking everything else over the award season. We knew it was coming. But it still was so special because of him. Every single um, uh, uh, acceptance speech that he's done has been different. He has changed it because everything is organic. He's not just reading off some stupid sheet. He's genuinely reacting to the moment at all. Like He's won like 14 fucking awards for this role. Yeah. And this guy was shut out of Hollywood for years. Years. Since he was like 11. Yeah. Because he was an Asian guy. Who, who had like a high pitched voice yeah. and didn't quite, you couldn't be the lead of a movie, but you also don't have the talent for this. And he, ah, it was just so cool for him to just be like, be like, look, like hold on to your dreams. Like they do matter. But no matter how old you are, it, it gives you just kind of that. You never know when you're going to flourish or when you're going to blossom yeah. as a human being. You never know when that opportunity will rise and you'll be able to take it on no matter what it is, no matter what you like to do. You know, if you're a writer, uh, you know, of course, you know, if you're an artist like this or if you're, a fucking construction worker who's like, I want that big job. Like, you never know. It might come when you're 60. You know, you just don't know. You got to hold on to that hope. And I love that he just has been preaching that for three months now. He just keeps doing it. So from from when I watched him watch the entire fucking Golden Globe ceremony and I watched him get that award, I was like, this guy might fucking run train on this entire fucking circuit. And he did. He did. And it was one of the first things they did the whole night. They, usually it's the first award they give out. Uh, this year they changed it up just a little bit, but he still got to kind of set the tone for the ceremony. And it, from there on out, it was just like super emotional and very rewarding. Delightful, charming. And he's just so optimistic. And, you know, he's got very little to be optimistic about. You know, his whole career was denied. 
And then he got cast in this. And even after this came out, it happened again. Yeah. He was uninsurable again for the same fucking reasons. Now he's an Academy Award winner and the fucking jobs are going to just, you know, they're going to come. 100%. He's already he's already been cast in season two of Loki for the MCU. That's going to be big for him. So I'm hoping for like an adult short round like series or something like that on Disney Plus. Yeah, it was yeah, cool man. when when Best Picture when Harrison Ford gave out Best Picture. Oh. Ko Kwan got to go up there and hug Doctor Jones. Yeah, that was ah oh, that was great. Yeah, that was a sweet <laughs> moment. Forty years, forty years in the making that moment. You know, so it was cool. And he and he beat like some damn good actors, uh, Brendan Gleeson and Barry. Keon, Keegan, Keogan, Keogan. Yeah. I, I've heard it pronounced five different ways over the past couple months. They were both nominated for Banshees. They're both great. Brian Terry Henry, look out for that guy. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he has a couple Oscar wins in the next 10, 15 years. He is just that good. And Judd Hirsch, who steals the show in the Fablemans for really it's one major, major scene, but the, it'll be engraved in my mind forever. The family art, you know, that, that kind of aggressive, moment in the movie where he's talking to a young Steven Spielberg and ah, it's a powerful, powerful performance. But we, we knew all along, this is Quan's um, all award season. He has so much to do in the movie, has some of the biggest moments in the movie where he says, you know, I just want to do laundry, laundry and taxes with you forever. Yeah, uh, He has some of the best moments. They wrote some of those moments for him. Ah, it's so beautiful. So that, that's a great group. That's a heist movie. I'd watch yeah. any, any fucking day. I, I think one of the things I love most about Kehoe Kwan he never whitened up his name, you know. He nope. never had to, you know, become like you know Jeff Kwan or something like that. Kenny, yeah. yeah. He kept his 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 Chinese name, and I bet that's a big part of why he got shut out. Yeah, because he wouldn't play ball. Yeah, and he like held on to like what made him yeah. who he is, like unique and special. So also, Chunk from the Goonies is his like agent, which is fucking great. Yeah, that's isn't that isn't that wonderful? <laughs> yeah, Jeff Cohen. Yeah, that was cool. He <laughs> shouted him out. Yeah, great stuff. Uh, also, great. Best actress in a lead role, Michelle Yeoh, takes the win. She also was dominating the circuit. Uh, she beat Kate Blanchett from Tar, which is probably second place. Yeah. Anna Darm is from Blonde, Boo. <laughs> Andre Riseborough for Two Leslie and uh, Michelle Williams for The Fablemans. I, I say Boo for because Blonde is just not a good movie. Um, nothing against Anna Darmus. I think she could have a cool career. I think she already has built a nice little filmography, has been a part of some awesome movies. This was just like mishandled. Yeah. And like miscast, um, all, all the above. It's really, really not her fault. She took on a job. She tried her best. There are a couple moments where she's acting her ass off, but man, they just, they just, they just botched that one. And I don't really ever want to bring it up again. You know, it's one of those movies that I, I question why am I watching this? <laughs> About an hour in, I was like, this, this is just not my cup of tea. But, you know, I haven't seen to Leslie. Uh, we don't have much to say about that one, but. This, this had to be a, a race between Michelle and Kate. They're both so damn good. On any other given year, if Kate was up last year, if Kate was up, the, you know, like they could have both won any year. That's really cool to have that kind of race between two people. Yeah, if they'd both, you know, whoever won between them two, it was Oscar history. Kate Blanchett gets three, yep. or Michelle Yeoh becomes the first Asian actress to win Best Actress. Yeah. And it's fucking great. I love her, you know, never... Like, to all the women in here, never let anybody tell you that you're past your prime. Yep. Because that's what everyone told her. She couldn't get roles, and then she got this. Now she's Academy Award winner, Michelle yeah, Yeoh. And now, it's one of those things that's... Sometimes I, I, I have to go to bat for the Oscars, because I, I understand. They're very silly, and it's kind of a circle jerk. But moments like that is, like, why it's worth watching, why it's worth having them, because now Michelle Yeoh... She now is is going to be in a TV show on Disney Plus. That's a big deal with other co co stars from Everything Ever All at Once. She now has a her own Criterion um, Channel collection, where it's I think it's just called Michelle Yo Kicks Ass, and it's like all of her martial arts movies on there. That wouldn't have happened without this. Yeah, she wouldn't have this last phase of her career without this movie, without this moment, without her winning, and kind of reminding everybody like, no, I've been here. I've been around. I've been dominating. You're just now waking up to it. Very, very similar to when Bong, Bong Joon-ho won a bunch of stuff. It's like, like some of my best movies are like 15 years old. <laughs> like, I've, I've been doing this. You just, you're just now waking up to it. That's kind of why it's important to recognize movies and artists that make the movies. Because if you don't do that, some people might never discover them for themselves. Yeah. 
So I, I don't know. Like I always have said that. Like because of uh, everything I wrote at once, getting all these nominations, it was in the theater for a year, a, a full calendar year because because of like the the waves it made around award season, and people were like, "Oh, you have to see this movie." That's now the Daniels can go make their other movie. Mm-hmm. Now Michelle Yeoh has her has her thing going. Now Quan. Now uh, Stephanie Su. We're, we're gonna she's gonna be around for sixty years. Jamie Lee Curtis, like, now we get to really properly celebrate her. That's why it's important. The Oscars have some kind of relevancy, you know, because of moments like this. Not everybody is willing to do the kind of work we do, you know, hunting down these performers and films for ourselves, exploring 60 plus years of film history. Some people need it to be spoon fed to them. Some people need to be told, this is who's cool, check them out. And the Academy does that for some people. You know, the phrase Academy Award winner is going to propel a lot of people to check out this work. Mm-hmm. And from there, they'll be able to find other stuff. It's all about celebrating the work and putting the work in a position where people care about it. And, I, you know, I'll champion this shit forever because at the very least, it's shining a spotlight on a lot of great work. Yeah, man. Like, there wasn't one winner tonight where I was like, like rolling my eyes, like, really? Like, come on. Like, everything was all oh, cool. Like, India got represented. Oh, an Asian woman won Best Lead Actress, you know? Like these two really unique dudes, this directing combo won a lot of stuff. This German movie dominated. I, I, that's, that's fucking cool. Movies getting recognized is cool and should be treated that way by movie fans. Yes. You don't have to stroke the Oscars dick. You know, you don't have to do that. And I, I, We don't do that. We love this stuff. We watch it every year. We predict it and stuff and talk about the outcome. It's not because we're obsessed with the organization we're obsessed with movies <laughs> that's like all that's all it is and when they get spotlighted it's it is important you should pay attention which leads us to the next category mm. best actor in a lead role um brendan fraser takes the win beating austin butler for elvis colin farrell for the banshees of inishirin paul mescal for after sun and bill nye for living um okay uh, again this proves our point now some 12 year old is going to be like, who's that? And their dad's gonna be like, I'll show you. <laughs> I'll show you Encino man. I'll show you airheads. I'll show you the mummy, you know, like I'll show you all this crazy 90s stuff where he was one of the most unique leading actors of that generation. And now he has this moment where he literally looked like he was about to have a heart attack. The entire speech probably didn't get to say everything he wanted to say. Cause he didn't even know what was going on. He was on like a different plateau than the rest of us. It was so special. He was high on life in that moment. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't look away, you know, and I know I'm a big fan, but I know you're one of his biggest fans. So take it away. Brandon Fraser has had the ultimate light at the end of the tunnel story since he unceremoniously was pretty much kicked out of Hollywood in the mid two thousands. Uh, he was, you know, sexually assaulted by a producer who went on to produce this year's Golden Globes and have zero consequences happen to him. Uh, he suffered a lot of, you know, physical ailments after his stunt work on The Mummy 3 fucked him up. Bitter divorce where he lost all his money. And it was just a downhill slope where he, you know, he gained a lot of weight. He got really depressed and he was not getting a lot of high profile work. And... All of a sudden, you know, we see him in a Steven Soderbergh movie a few years ago, No Sudden Move. He doesn't look that healthy. And I remember Caleb and I watched that and we were like, oh, shit. Yeah. I hope he's doing okay. Then The Whale came about. And we saw, you know, some first look footage. He looked unhealthy. Thankfully, he, you know, that was just a suit. I was really worried. I was like, oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Then I saw him on the red carpet. And I'm like, oh, no, he's lost a lot of weight. He, he, actually, looks, he actually looks pretty good. And he started doing interviews and you know, he found out how beloved he was and how much fan love he still had and how much currency he still had in Hollywood because of that. And now he's an Academy Award winner and it's one of the most deserving wins I've ever seen. It is an amazing performance. He poured so much of his pain into that movie. Yeah. And you buy it. And I'm so happy he took that. I was in tears. It's the one thing I wanted from this ceremony. Yeah. And we got it. And I'm so excited to see what he gets to do next now. He is back. It's the Renaissance, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so happy. And I just, I I wish I could, you know, by, if by some miracle he ever hears this, thank you. Mm. And I'm so proud of you. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> super special moment, man. 
Um, just kind of one of those, one of those moments where you, you just kind of stop and smell the flowers, you know, yeah. and, and enjoy, enjoy the moment and be like, oh, life is actually pretty cool sometimes. And he, he, he brought that to life. So, um, can't wait to watch this movie. I, I don't even feel like I, <laughs> I, I obviously want to see it, but I, I didn't, I didn't need it to appreciate him and that moment of that speech and kind of just what it means for his career. There were a couple times he was like, looked down at it and was like, holy fuck. Yeah. Cause he's, you know, <laughs> he's the guy from Encino man, airheads. He yep. was, you know, George of the fucking jungle. Yeah, just this goofball. Yeah. And then he had such a horrible series of unfortunate events happen to him and he lost faith. He lost hope in himself and he got it back. He found it again. He yeah. found his X factor again. He used it and he, he climbed back to the top of the mountain. And if that's not a goddamn inspiration, I don't know what is. Yeah. You're Brendan a, Fraser. You're not human. Yeah. He's a, he's a fucking hero of mine. And yeah. I will, I'll preach that man's praises forever. Yeah, man. And, and you know, we always do the um, supporting actor a heist thing. Yeah. What about this group? <laughs> Bill Nye as kind of the leader of the, of the group, yeah. the old veteran. <laughs> Paul Mescal and Austin Butler, the young guns. Like, uh, yeah, we know, you know, we're the crowd control guys. And Colin Farrell and Brendan Fraser are just kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. They, <laughs> Brendan Fraser needs, like, the heist money to, like, you know, get his wife a new kidney or something. Yeah. And Colin Farrell's his, like, buddy who's like, ride or die, man, I got you. Yeah, he's the Jeremy, he's the Jeremy Renner who's yeah. just kind of like, ah, yeah. yeah, I'll fuck some people up, I guess. Yeah. He's coach from The Gentleman. Yeah. He's like, yeah, you know, I got you. <laughs> uh, that would be a sick movie. I'd see that. I'd see that right now. I'll, I'll pay whatever I need to pay. Uh, directed by... Ruben Oslin. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> uh, best director. Uh, the Daniels take the win. We, we knew that was coming. Uh, beating Todd Field for Tar, Martin McDonough for uh, the Banshees of Inisherin, Ruben Oslin for Triangle of Sadness, which got nothing. Yeah. Uh, and Steven Spielberg, Fablemans, also nothing. Uh, Tar, Fablemans, Triangle of Sadness, Elvis. Elvis won nothing? Yeah, Elvis didn't get nothing. Yeah, anything. all shut out. All no wins. But, you know, I heard, I can't remember who it was, but I heard someone say, look, if you're nominated, that's the recognition. Yeah. Like, of course, getting the you know gold statue is cool, and you can put that in your 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 cabinet, your shelf, or whatever, and it's gonna be like a memento. You know, it's a reminder of like, oh, look at all the hard work I've done. But if you're nominated, you're etched in history forever. You're on the internet forever as a nominee. When people go look at any given ceremony, and your name's there, it's there. It's not going away. So you know, Steven Spielberg, Steven Spielberg, he doesn't need that shit. He's been nominated fucking forty times. Like he. <laughs> His movies are, are, you know, limitless, timeless. And so he's just adding to that legacy. Ruben Oslin, it's a big moment for him. Yeah. This is where, this is his coming out party. He's yeah. been making movies for a while, but this is him like kind of breaking into the, the Western part of the world. Hey, like I, I know what I'm doing. Martin McDonough, this guy, I, every time he makes a movie, it seems like it's up for stuff. You know, he's one of those guys. Yeah. And uh, Todd, four, same four. with Todd Field. Yeah. Uh, he's only made three like feature films, uh, In the Bedroom, Little Children, and, and now this. They've all been up for stuff. So these are, these are guys that are, are no, you know, they're, they're no stranger to, to what's going on here. The Daniels were strangers and they beat all of them. <laughs> and that's pretty cool. And again, they were so grateful, had, had really cool stuff to say. Um, so I, yeah, especially Daniel Kwan, like he really kind of took the spotlight and was like, I'm freaking out. I'm rambling, but I, I, I love what I do. It was cool. Well, also, you know, I feel like, Nobody's making these movies to win Oscars. They're, if you are, it ends up being Empire of Light, Sam Mendes. And, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. you get shut out because they can sniff that shit out now. Yeah, they can tell. You can tell when you're just trying to kiss ass. Yeah. Uh, Whereas, like, Jordan Peele was like, I don't give a fuck. I'm making nope. And I don't care. Yeah. And it was shut out completely. No nominations. And, again, that's going to be one of the movies that's remembered forever from this year, even if it wasn't up for anything. So I, I like I like it both ways, you know? I like when it does get nominated, and I, I also understand this isn't the end-all, be-all. Yeah. A film like The Fablemans, you know, isn't Spielberg being like, oh, I'm getting that third. No. No. It's him saying, I have a lot of pent-up anger towards my parents, and I got to get that out or it's going to kill me. I, and I might be able to help someone. Yeah. Along the way. It's a movie about, you know, accepting your role in life, finding your dream, shooting for it, and also just, you know, for learning how to forgive and how painful and difficult that can be. It's, it's a very strong movie, regardless of whether or not it won anything. Yeah, I really, really liked The Fablemans. I watched it Saturday night, 
you know, the night before the ceremony. And it was, it was kind of the last one on my like list of, I must see this. And I, and I also had access to it because you rented it. So I was like, why not? And I was, I was so moved by it. I was so moved by what Spielberg was putting on the table. But most importantly, I was moved by all the performances. Show Williams, Paul Dano. I can't remember the kid's name that plays Sammy. Like the, you know, basically Steven Spielberg. But like fucking Seth Rogen was awesome. Yeah. Everyone just kind of just kind of brought it, and then the the end, the cameo at the end is one of the finest moments of 2022. Uh, one of my favorite filmmakers of all time playing one of the greatest filmmakers of all time at the end, giving young Steven Spielberg, like 19 year old Steven Spielberg, some awesome advice. It was just such a great way to send off that movie. Um, so I, yeah, I, I was I was never bored. It's like two and a half hours, but I never once like looked at my phone. If I did, I paused it and I was texting you like, dude, this is good. You know, that, that's that's usually what I do when I'm watching watching films because I know you're probably up and also watching something. So, uh, yeah, this, I, I'd give it to any five, any of these five, best director. Um, I feel like, I feel like All Quiet on the Western Front like kind of deserves a spot here. If it's going to be up for all this other shit, I, I, it's, but who do you take out? I don't know. It's really tough. So uh, that's that's the thing with, Five nominees, you know, you have that exclusivity, which I like. It makes it kind of cutthroat. And this is a cutthroat, cutthroat uh, ceremony where the Daniels came out on top again. And Best Picture also. Everything Ever All At Once takes the dub, beating All Quiet on the Western Front, Avatar, The Way of Water, The Banshees of Inisherin, Elvis, The Fablemans, Tar, Top Gun Maverick, Triangle of Sadness, and Women Talking. It's a good group. It's a great group. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that... There was a lot of good films represented this year. Nothing feels forced in, no. from, apart from like Blonde. Uh, yeah, you got you always have a couple, but the top ten, you know, the best picture group, you know, Avatar probably doesn't deserve to be there, but everything else does. It's it was just a nice celebration of the year in film, and of course, you know, everything everywhere all at once was the film nobody stopped talking about since it came out. Yep. It was for a year. Yeah, it was unique. It was fun. It was weird. It was cool. It was funny. It was dramatic. It was scary. It was everything. And I like that a film that represents everything film can offer taking best picture. It's a hybridization of every genre yeah. and a film about family, about an immigrant family. And it's a best picture winner now. Yeah. When it has all this going for it, as far as, you know, representation and diversity, it's one of the most American. American dream type stories that I've like, I, I've seen in recent years that was like really well done about family, about finding your own identity. It, it's just, it's, it's just awesome. I can't wait to rewatch it now uh, with the lens of being a best picture winner. Yeah. I always do that every year, the following week at some point, you know, like last year I watched Coda the year before at Nomadland, you know, Parasite. I always watch it again. And in this case, it's been a full year. So like, I'm ready for that rewatch. I've been <laughs> wanting to rewatch it anyway, but I'm ready now and just kind of have fun with it. You know, when I saw in theaters, I was like, this is unique. Like, this is really cool. And like everyone that I worked with, all my friends were just like, dude, you got to see this. Like, it's so cool. It's so different. It made me cry. It made me laugh. And I, you know, and I felt that while I was in the theater. And now I want to just have fun with it and celebrate it. And um, it's a winner. It's yeah. it's going to be a part of our, our um, kind of our vocabulary, our language forever. Yeah. I love a film that celebrates the little moments of love. The little piece, not just not the grandiose gestures, but little things like I want to do laundry and taxes with you. Yeah. Like that's life. Life is is little moments. Life is, you know, the bits of, of good moments we get to take and keep with us. And in this vast multiversal crazy ass movie, that's the core. Yeah, that's all really there for just entertainment. The The moments between, you know, husband and wife and mother and daughter, like those, th that's the that's the blood of the movie, you know? That's the veins. Like, when the when Stephanie Sue looks at Michelle Yeoh and is like, let me go. Like, <laughs> it's one of the, I, I was just shattered. I remember watching and I was just shattered by it because I now have a four-year-old daughter. I know there's going to be moments that come where I don't understand how to, how to how to let her do what she needs to do as a human being. You know, I know those are coming. I, I just don't know when it's going to happen and I don't know how I'm going to handle it, but I, I know we have a good relationship. So, like, that's all that matters. And, that's what you have to hold on to. So it just kind of reaches, it meets people where they're at. That's what's really great about it. So uh, hats off to all the, all the winners, all the nominees. 
A good shit, good show. Thanks, Jimmy Kimmel. I mean, all the uh, the songs that were performed, they were, they were solid. Like, it was just a good show overall. I feel good. I feel like I'm going to go home tonight and fucking sleep well. Last year, I was, like, on edge. So, uh, <laughs> this feels nice. Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's a good, you know, good uh, palate cleanser for last year's <sighs> fucking travesty of a show. Now we can just go back to, you know, embracing positivity and celebrating the films that deserve to be celebrated. Yeah, hundred percent, man. And you know, we'll do it again next year, right? Um, you know, we'll we'll make this a um, film guys and tradition with just Connor and I, because the rest of our team <laughs> doesn't really give a shit. Uh, <laughs> love you, Caleb. Love you, Josh. Colton, uh, you guys are great. Uh, you guys should be happy that Jamie Lee Curtis won. Just saying, I'm just gonna say that to the team. Yeah. I did text. I told Caleb about Jamie Lee and Brandon Fraser, and he was really happy about that. Yeah, so, how can you not yeah. smile when then, it, you know? And then Isabel sent me a, you know, Brendan. And I'm like, fuck yeah. Yeah, so, Brendan. Yeah. 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 Good, good shit. So, yeah, we'll do this again next year. We'll do a kind of a, on, on the Monday after the Oscars, we'll, we'll always release kind of a, our own little recap. Um, and I hope you guys listened to our episode that came out on Friday. It was a lot of fun. The Best Picture Winners Tournament. Who knows? Maybe in the future we can do another one with everything, everywhere, all at once <laughs> in the tournament. But, uh, yeah, I think that wraps it up for, for today. Uh, we'll see you guys soon, I'm sure. You know, um, Follow us on uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Check out our website. Check out Letterboxd. Uh, Austin Johnson over here and uh, Connor95 uh, on there. We're constantly rating movies, writing reviews, and having fun on there, trying to interact with people. So uh, keep watching movies, guys, and we'll, we'll see you later this week. <laughs>